Aim High 3 by Tim Faller and Paul A. Davis with Jane Hudson Published and copyright Oxford University Press 2010 CD 3 Unit 8 Page 67 Read Exercise 2 Read and listen to the text Big Cat Diary by Daisy Miller I've always dreamt of seeing a leopard aim high three since I watched a BBC wildlife documentary about them. I like the fact that they're so independent. The females are the boss. They hunt alone. They're stealthy and strong, and their markings are beautiful. So we're on our way to the South Luangwa Valley in Zambia. There is one leopard for every kilometre, and you can do night drives there, which adds to your chances of seeing them. I think the fact they are nocturnal and hard to find makes it more exciting. Mfui International Airport is the smallest I have ever seen. There is a tiny shop selling postcards and that's it. We climb into a jeep, which takes us to Nkwali, trundling past mud huts and groups of children wearing school uniform or carrying farm tools, sometimes both. Finally, we arrive at the camp. Six huts and a cafe, built round a tree. That night, we go out on our first game drive with Rocky, our guide. Straight away, we're driving across a plain full of impala and baboons. Now comes the big moment. We hear something in the trees, and suddenly we are right in the middle of a lion hunt, in the dark. We listen to the baboon's alarm calls, and when Rocky switches on the light, we see two lionesses on either side, and one tearing after an impala. They miss the kill, but even so my heart is thumping. The next morning, we go on a drive and spot baboons crossing the road. Suddenly, a trunk appears from the bush, and three elephants stroll across right in front of us, including a baby. That's how it is on the drives, a new creature every time. We get giraffes, then a crocodile, then a buffalo. But my favourite excursion is the walking safari. We set off across the plain with an armed guard. Rocky tells us the golden rule. Never run unless I say so. And if I say, get up the tree, get up the tree. The next morning, two other guests boast about having seen a leopardess and her cub. We look at pictures on their digital camera. I'm really cross, because there probably won't be another sighting for ages, and tonight is our last night here. But I'm still hopeful. This time, we're out with Zebron, but after just a few minutes, our jeep gets stuck on a muddy trail. It takes ages to dig us out, and my heart is sinking. Then it starts pouring. We sit in the dark and complain about the rain, and then suddenly two impala hurtle from the bushes. Moments later, the leopardess springs out behind us. We all sit in absolute silence and stare at her. Leopards are much stronger than lions, and she looks incredibly powerful. When she realises she's being watched, she darts back into the bush. It's really awesome. We're soaked through, but I don't care about that. I'm just so happy I've seen a leopard. My dream has come true. Unit 8, page 69. Grammar. Exploit. Exercise 4. Listen and check. 1. The train was invented in Britain in 1829. 2. In 2000, the Channel Tunnel was opened between England and France. 
Three. The Trans-Siberian Railway was finished in 1916. Four. The tram system in Alexandria was completed in 1860. Five. Passengers have been carried on the London Underground since 1863. Six. Samand cars are made in Iran. Unit 8, page 70. Vocabulary. Exercise 1. Read and listen to Ben's story. We were flying into London on our way home. We seemed to circle Heathrow Airport for ages, but at last the air traffic controller allowed our plane to land. After taxiing from the runway, the plane finally reached the terminal building. Once in the terminal, we queued to go through passport control and waited to collect our luggage. Our rucksacks arrived quickly and we didn't need a trolley, so we walked straight through customs and out of the airport. All we had to do now was get into London and catch the train home to Cambridge. After travelling round the world for three months, that was the easy part. Or so we thought. B. We decided to go by underground into central London, so we went down the escalator, bought a ticket and made our way to the correct platform. It was unbelievably crowded, but we managed to push our way onto the train and it set off. However, when the train stopped at Knightsbridge Station, a voice announced that there was a problem with the track ahead and we would have to get off and continue our journey by a different route. C. Fortunately, there was a black cab outside, so we jumped in and asked the driver to take us to King's Cross Station as quickly as possible. Then the cab came to a sudden halt. Not again. This time, there was a terrible traffic jam. We didn't want to waste any more time, so we got out and walked to the station. We got there, bought our tickets, ran onto the platform and got into the nearest carriage. We had made it. Then we realised the train was going to Stevenage, not Cambridge. We hadn't checked the departures board and we were on the wrong train. Unit 8, page 70. Listen. Listen to four announcements and dialogues. One. Oh dear, that looks like a nasty traffic jam. Hmm, I think there's been an accident up ahead. How far is it to the station from here? Only a couple of hundred yards. It's up ahead on the left. You'll be quicker walking, you know. OK, let's get out of here. How much do we owe you? Uh, nine pounds eighty. Um, here's eleven pounds. Keep the change. Oh, thanks very much. Two. Ladies and gentlemen, could I have your attention, please? This service will terminate here due to a fault with the track between here and the next station. Please get off the train here and continue your journey by bus or taxi. Make sure you take all your belongings with you when you leave the train. London Underground apologizes for any inconvenience this will cause. Good evening, everyone. This is your captain speaking. Unfortunately, we're going to land slightly late tonight at Manchester Airport. I've been talking to the air traffic controller, and there are four planes in a queue ahead of us. As soon as they've landed, I'll have you safely on the runway, and I think that'll be in about ten minutes' time. I hope you've enjoyed your flight with us today. Four. Tickets, please. Here you are. That's great, thanks. Uh, tickets, please. Do you fancy something to drink? 
Yeah, that's a good idea. I'm really thirsty. I'll have a cup of tea, please. Okay, I'll be back in a minute. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. For your information, the buffet service is now closed. Oh, great. Unit 8, page 73. Language skills. Exercise 1. Listen and check. Can you help me? I can't find my jacket anywhere. When did you last see it? I left it in the changing rooms while I was in the gym. Was there anybody in the changing rooms at the time? No, they were empty. Nobody else was in there. Perhaps someone took it home by mistake. Actually, I think it's been stolen. I don't think so. Nothing has ever been taken from the changing rooms before. I'm afraid that's not true. My bag has been opened several times and last week my friend's mobile phone was stolen. Everybody knows the changing rooms aren't safe anymore. But this gym is used by over a hundred people. How should I know who the thief is? I don't know, but I hope he'll be caught very soon or I'm going to look for another gym. Everyday English 8 Teacher's Book Page 116 At the airport Exchanging information Exercise 1 Listen and complete the dialogue. Good morning, sir. Good morning. May I see your passport, please? Yes, certainly. Thank you. May I ask which flight you arrived on, Mr. Wilson? Yes, the British Airways flight from Heathrow. I see. Can you tell me how long you'll be staying in the United States, sir? Three weeks. You have a return flight, don't you? Yes, I do. On the 14th of July. Would you like to see the ticket? No, that's okay. Could you tell me what the purpose of your visit is? Yes, I'm visiting relatives. My uncle lives here. Would you mind telling me where you'll be staying, sir? At his house in Boston. Do you know if you'll be visiting any other cities during your stay? We'll probably be traveling round a bit. I'd like to see New York. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Enjoy your stay. Everyday English 8 Teacher's Book Page 116 At the airport Exchanging information. Exercises 4 and 5. Listen. 1. Good afternoon. Can I help you? Yes, I'm flying to Rome this afternoon. Can you tell me where I should check in? Do you know which airline you are flying with? Yes, it's British Airways. British Airways, let me see... Uh, you can check in at desks 31 to 35. Ah. Uh, have you any idea if the flight is on time? Yes, it's on time. No delays are expected. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Two. Hello. I wonder if you could help me. What would you like to know? I've just arrived from Dublin. And I need to find a hotel. Are you looking for a hotel near the airport or downtown? Downtown. Well, here's a list of recommended hotels. The cheapest are at the top, the most expensive at the bottom. I can make a reservation for you from here. Okay, um, let me see. The Washington Hotel near Central Park looks nice. Could you ring them and see if they have any vacancies? Certainly, sir. Could you tell me how many nights you'll be staying? Just the one. Okay. Good evening, Washington Hotel. Oh, good evening. I have a gentleman here who's looking for a room for one night. Three. Good morning, madam. Good morning. Where are you travelling to? Madrid. May I have your ticket and passport, please? Thank you. Can you tell me if you have any bags to check in? 
Yes, one suitcase. Did you pack the suitcase yourself? Yes, I did. Could I have a window seat, please? Certainly, madam. We have 10A for you. That's a window seat. Thank you. The flight is boarding from gate number 10 at 12.30. Thank you. Thank you. Have a pleasant flight. Literature Corner 4 Page 74 Exercise 1 Read and listen to the text. The Dead of Jericho by Colin Dexter Inside Nine Canal Reach, Constable Walters entered the kitchen. Inspector Morse was here a few minutes ago, sir, he said to Inspector Bell, a tall, black-haired man. What on earth did he want? asked Bell crossly. He just asked a few questions, sir. Do you know him well? I suppose so. We've worked together once or twice. He's a strange man. Very strange. People say he's clever. Yes, that's right. Bell was an honest man. Cleverest detective I've ever met. Cleverer than most of us, anyway. He never married, did he? <laughs> Too lazy for that. Like spending his free time in cafes <laughs> or listening to Mozart, Bell laughed. Then he stopped and looked sharply at Walters. Now perhaps you'd like to tell me exactly what questions he asked. As Walters repeated Morse's questions, Bell listened carefully. Of course, it was strange that the front door wasn't locked, and he still didn't know who had rung the police. But he had only just started investigating the case. He would know more details soon. Anyway, details were not really necessary because it was a simple case of suicide. She had hanged herself by attaching a rope to the ceiling, standing on a chair and kicking it away. As an experienced police officer, he had seen many suicides like this. Perhaps when his men searched the house, they would find a note explaining why she had killed herself. There was only one thing that worried Bell and he hadn't told the police doctor or Walters or any of his men about it. How does a woman, at that terrible fatal moment, kick the chair away so that it lands almost two metres away from her? But it didn't really matter, he told himself. He was sure it was suicide. Bell did not find the suicide note he was looking for. But there was at least one note which Anne Scott had written the night before she died, a note which was delivered and received. Constable Walters and Inspector Bell searched the two small bedrooms of Nine Canal Reach, looking for clues. They found large piles of letters in the drawers of a desk. Anne had obviously tried to arrange them in some kind of order, they spent some time looking through the letters, but in the end, Bell only seemed interested in three things. A recent letter from Anne's mother, an address book, and a desk diary. Skills Roundup, 7 to 8, page 75. Listen. Exercises 1 and 2. Listen to people talking about holidays. Tony. We live in London, but we have family in Devon, which is in the southwest of England. Devon is really beautiful, with lots of lovely countryside and beaches. My aunt and uncle have lived in an old farmhouse there for over ten years now, and every summer we go and stay with them for a few weeks. Being in London in summer is not very pleasant so my sister and I really look forward to going there. There are lots of things to do, and we get on really well with our cousins. We cycle to the beach or go for walks, and sometimes we go out in my uncle's boat. There's a surfing beach nearby, so we've been practicing our surfing. I'm not very good, but it's great fun. I wouldn't like to live there in winter, though. It's too boring then. 
Karen. My mum used to live in Portugal, so we often go back there for our holidays, just the two of us. We never stay in the same place. We always hire a car and drive to different places. We visit Lisbon, the capital city, for example, or visit my mum's friends on the west coast. Now and then we cross over the border and go to the south of Spain. Once we went to Gibraltar, that tiny part of Spain which is still British. That was interesting, though I wouldn't like to live there. Portugal is lovely though, and the people are very friendly and kind. My mum speaks Portuguese fluently, of course, and I can speak a bit too, though it's not an easy language to pronounce. And it's always warm and sunny there. Such a nice place for a holiday. Dan and Jill We both have quite busy jobs, so holidays are important to us. We like to get away from it all and do something completely different. We save some of our money every month and put it away for our next holiday. We've recently found something we love doing, skiing. We tried it for the first time two years ago and thought it was wonderful. Yes, I didn't think I would enjoy it that much as I don't like the cold. But on a beautiful white mountain with a blue sunny sky, it doesn't feel cold at all. Skiing's expensive though, so we try to arrange something at the last minute so we can get the holiday cheaper. So far we've been to Austria. This year I think we're going to Switzerland. We can't wait. Chris I'm 17 now and I used to go on holiday with my parents and little sisters, but I never enjoyed it very much. Wherever we went, either in Britain or sometimes France or Italy, my dad wanted to look at all the churches and historical buildings. The occasional old place can be interesting, I suppose, but I used to get so bored. My mum took my little sisters to a cafe for yet another ice cream, and there I was stuck between old churches and pink ice creams. So last year, I decided to do something different. Now when my family goes on holiday, I go somewhere on my own in Britain. So far I've been canoeing and kayaking, mountain climbing and camping, and it's been just great. There are lots of people my age, and we all learn something new and get to know each other at the same time. I've done so many new things and met so many people. I wish I had thought of it sooner.